Arcane, a Star Wars story. Arcane is the internet's golden child. I should probably say up front that I did enjoy the show, but there's definitely flaws that are being lost amongst all of its praise. Story breaking issues that left me unsatisfied with the current state of the show, and had they been addressed, could have really benefited the series. I don't know how hot these takes will actually be, so please. Don't lose your nuts. I made a nice little number list of each topic, but before we get into the criticism, I thought it would be nice to share how much of a positive experience I had with Arcane. Number one, strengths of the show. The intro sold me on this series. After watching the first three episodes, I enthusiastically recommended it to everyone. Arcane got me to jump back into League of Legends, a game I hadn't touched in almost a decade. That's how quickly I was invested in this series. The animation was incredible, the way it captured the lighting and the dingy setting of the steampunk atmosphere. In the intro, we got this moving prologue. Everything was emoted through simple and poignant expressions. Besides just looking visually distinct, the movement of the animation was equally impressive. When these characters run, they run and really throw their weight around. The desperation shines in these moments, and it's emphasized with the impacts and shakes of the camera. There's so much fluidity, spit and all, and the dynamic movement of the shots that enhance the storytelling, and really sell the rugged impact that these characters can throw around. The fight scenes in this series are fantastic. People absolutely get put down in this show. It's been a while since I've seen someone who'd been hit that hard, and I just went, oh, they're either dead or wish they were because that hit was life-altering. The character blocking is present in every scene. Everyone is active and fulfilling a purpose. Overall, the choreography is rugged and dirty, which really sells how brutal the hits can be and the strength behind every character. Vivri swagger, and she has the skills to back it up. There are moments of just pure cool sprinkled throughout the show, and I absolutely love it. All this probably comes from the years of character design at Riot. The art design and mannerisms of each character are distinct and make an immediate impression of their personality. The first three episodes were tight-knit stories that took its time to get us established in this world. The most interesting of those story threads was the relationship between Powder and Vi. I'm going to emphasize Powder because Jinx is a whole can of worms that we'll get into later. What I loved about their dynamic was highlighted by the way Vi carries herself. The difference between the ruffian tough gal shell Vi masked around everyone and the gentle encouraging sister she was towards Powder. Vi genuinely wanted to leave a better world for Powder and it's easy for me to want to root for them to be reunited and reconnected as sisters. So where do things all go wrong? Number two, the bridge. We get this touching moment when Vi tells Caitlyn about Powder and her growing up, how they try to outdo each other by creating the scarier imaginative monster, and that she would comfort her if Powder got too scared. It was a great way to reflect on their history and dive into Vi's current mindset. The way they left things off haunts her and she desperately wants to make amends. What's frustrating is that Vi's agency to find her sister shifts to fit the story. By the time they arrive at the bridge, Vi had gone from wanting to help take down Silco with Echo and Caitlyn, to dropping that ordeal in order to find her sister. I can't leave her again, she says. And it makes me ask, why is she just feeling this now? If it couldn't wait until after the council meeting, then why did this thought occur to her while she was still at the firelight base? Clearly this is a priority device since bailing on Caitlyn and Echo is acceptable to her, even though they're trying to take down Silco, an action that would only benefit Vi's cause to reach her sister. Silco is not only responsible for the murder of her surrogate father, but for all she knows, is also responsible for indoctrinating powder in the first place. But apparently this just clicked with her on the bridge and she'd rather drop helping them out and go track her down. It seems like this that hurt the show because it's clear that they're only separating her, but only just far enough so that she can still witness the actions that are about to transpire and jump back into the scene. Jinx, being Jinx, does some terrorism, which leads all the characters at a standoff. So then not only does Vi first leave them on their own to begin with, but then when she gets the opportunity to do the thing that she just left them for, you know, go reconnect with her sister, something that in the current situation would be the most beneficial for all parties, considering she has been most effective at reaching Powder, Vi instead lets Echo take the wheel, gives a sad look at her sister, and puts a pause on, I'm going to reiterate the thing that she had just left them to go do. Sure, she was helping a wounded Caitlyn, a duo ship just as hard as everyone else, but the inconsistent shift in priorities really took me out of the moment. It felt less of something that a character would do and more like a decision being made for the character to prevent her from reaching her goals. I am okay with their issues not being resolved completely. Not everyone gets a neat, meaningful arc, but since the relationship between Powder and Vi was the main drive of the story, it's pretty unsatisfying for Vi to unsuccessfully reach her sister through no fault of her own, but through the story railroading her ability to actually hold more than a three-minute conversation with her. This dissatisfaction was my main gripe with the show, because the ending is so empty and completely devoid of any conclusion to almost every storyline. The closest thing to a conclusion is the death of Silco, but we'll get to that whole mess in a bit. Number 3. Marcus Why say Vi just to lock her up and throw away the key? 
Was there any reason other than to keep her out of the picture so we could age up all the characters? Because any excuse would have been nice. It could have been as petty as Vi dying would have been too quick of a death for her, and Marcus wanted to avenge Grayson, so he kept Vi locked up as punishment. It is mentioned that the guards go out of their way to make her life a living hell, so it would make some sense. Vi's arrest is a pretty important detail to address, and it would have added some much-needed character death to Marcus. He clearly had some respect for Grayson, even though he spent the whole time undermining and going against her wishes, so it would have been an interesting dynamic for him to hold some animosity towards Vi for her death. But then, if that was the reason, then why didn't Marcus drag Vi away after Grayson was killed? He knew she was locked in the cellar. I don't have much to say about that possibility, because clearly the show wasn't interested in diving into it either. Vi even lampshades the reason as to why she was locked up herself, so I'm not going to let this slide. It's too much of an important plot point just to be dismissed with a single line of dialogue. The other whole mess involving Marcus coincidentally is the bridge scene. Maybe don't tell Marcus your plan, Caitlin. Like Echo claims Silco is paying off enforcers to attack Firelights. I know being naive about the conditions of the Undercity is part of your character, but being ignorant about something doesn't mean you're completely clueless. She could have said that she was on counselor business because I'm sure she wouldn't have to disclose information regarding that line of work. Plus, she should have been somewhat aware of the corruption at this point because Marcus had been railroading her from the beginning of the investigation. There's more than enough reason for her to be suspicious of him. Also, Marcus's face as he hesitated to kill Caitlyn is just hilarious. I don't know if they just didn't give him enough direction, but watching his confliction while thinking about carrying out a murder, as if he has all the time in the world to be indecisive, is just too fun. It reminds me of people that are always in front of me at the drive-thru. Like, I know this is a pretty big decision for him, but Caitlyn is unbound has been shown to act on her feet, so it's amusing that she'd leave the lives of her companions and herself up to a man who looks this constipated. One positive is that I do like how Marcus unceremoniously dies. So many people get a good, fulfilling monologue as they die to reach the final lap of their story arc, but fittingly with Marcus's constant ambiguity and unexplored character death, so too does he die, unable to utter any meaningful last words. Number four, unchanged status quo. In act one, there's this mysterious power play between Vander and Silco. Silco played from the shadows, chipping away at Vander's influence. Silco was a ghost of Vander coming back to haunt him. After act one, things just unceremoniously reset. We're left to wonder what Silco's role is exactly in the Undercity. There are two immediate examples of Silco's control that we see, one being the citizens of the lanes addicted to Shimmer, and the other is a refurbished last drop covered in neon lights. His exact reign of influence was unclear. Did he just expand into the lanes and work alongside the Kim Barons? We don't even establish the Kim Barons until Act 3. I just kind of presumed because it was directly stated by Grayson that without Vander, the Undercity would erupt into chaos, but instead things seem to be right where they left off. The status quo never changed. The closest thing to Silco's role being discussed early on in Act 2 was an offhand remark by Caitlin, in which he is referred to as an industrialist, but it's this kind of vagueness that makes it seem like he's still working from the shadows, which makes the ignorance of the console not so surprising, but cargo ships are being bombed, and there were already high tensions between the two factions before. What's going on? Are they still at each other's throats? Because I'm not really seeing it. The only form of backlash towards Silco mainly comes from Echo and the Firelights, but they seem to be in such disarray that they pose almost no threat to Silco's cause, and are only one bad raid away from being completely wiped out. By the looks of it, no one lifted a finger to try to stop Silco. Echo said, a few tried, but Silco's got the muscle and the money. The muscle? What muscle? The seven people posing around him? The last we saw him in his base of operations had just exploded with a bunch of goons left inside. If anything, this would be a complete setback with a small gain of abducting a new child soldier. It's not like these questions immediately need to be answered, but it's pretty important to establish what kind of power your antagonist holds in the story. Number five, the Kim Barons. The simplest fix is that the Kim Barons could have been introduced in episode four. That way we could see how Soko established himself in the Undercity. Introducing them earlier means that they won't try to double cross him with in two succeeding episodes. Also, why did the one Kim Baron have her kid interning at Soko's child labor factory? That seems like a pretty sketchy place for someone with a relative amount of influence to send their child. After raiding the factory, Vice says one of the dumbest things in the entire show. Episode 8, Cold opens on the cold, dead eyes of the child who had fallen off the railing, and in a strange justification for their actions, she says, he knew what he was signing up for. Like, seriously, Vi? The child didn't know better, and probably didn't even have a choice in the matter. His mother probably used this factory as some form of elaborate daycare system. Because you know damn well, if Vi was in his shoes, she'd also be running for the alarm. But after that comment, she turns around and actually makes a good point, saying, One dead kid, 
There's hundreds thanks to Silco, and thanks to people like you who stuck your heads in the dirt. It's very poignant that this child, like Powder, has been a piece of Silco's sick play to power, and it could have been an interesting aspect to explore how Silco manipulates and uses these people all in the name of the Zon. Number six, loyalty to Silco. This brings me to ask, why does anyone follow this man? He's an absolute asshat to everyone who works under him. Besides Jinx, of course. Maybe it's their mad respect for his ability to drop sick one-liners, but Silco's been given zero reasons to be loyal to him throughout the show. Sivika have sacrificed her whole arm to defend him, and he treats her with complete disregard. When she returns after having it shot up by Caitlyn, he has the audacity to taunt her about how her arm is oozing goo everywhere and is making a mess. Like, if you're trembling as you bluff your way through a power grab or your position, because you have no idea if your most loyal supporter is about to betray you, maybe it's time to reevaluate the way you treat people who are willing to support your cause. It's so disingenuous and it makes me take his concern towards Jinx less seriously because he shows absolutely no emotional connections towards his followers. He just treats them like the pawns they are. One poor minion gets the life beat the hell out of them after Soko monologues for too long and Vi gets away. Like, why does the Undercity follow Soko? Vi is right. He put fucked up delusions in Jinx's head and people see this man as a good father figure? He's the perfect example of the horrible toxic person. Sure, these kinds of people can have nice moments where they act like a good person, but it's moments like these that perpetuate horrible abusive relationships. I have to put an emphasis on this, because we've been along the ride with Soko the whole time. The curtain was pulled back in episode 3, where you know what he's about now, so why are we getting scraps of his current plan and absolutely nothing about his relationships with anyone besides Jinx? Number 7. How does Jinx fit into this? The only time we see his plan in action is at the beginning of Act 2, when Jinx is completely undermining him by quite literally blowing the lid off his operation and opening an investigation into their dealings. Sure, Soko is smart enough not to directly implicate himself, but drawing this much attention when he's so clearly trying to keep this low-key seems about the worst possible idea. It's just sloppy and it makes it hard to take Soko seriously when he doesn't seem to have a grasp on the situation. Yes, he acknowledges that Jinx can be a thorn in his side, but you can't just lay up shade away in consistencies with your story. People always have double standards when it comes to their ideologies, and exploring that hypocrisy is what makes a character fascinating to me, but this show never gets to the why Soko is the way he is. Undermining the smuggling operation and drawing lots of unwanted attention to the matter that seems to require subtlety by sending your indoctrinated child soldier seems like a pretty bad call. This sudden disregard for working in the shadows which has been consistent with his character makes me wonder why in the absolute hell Jinx would be involved with most of the work being done here. Folks certainly fear her, as they freak out after Jinx traps them in a room she decorated as if she were Michael fucking Myers, so there's definitely some knowledge at least in the underground of the dangers she brings. She could have been a boogeyman-like character that Soko would summon for less than subtle jobs. Or better yet, she could have just been Powder. She could have been this badass protege that perfected her engineering skills and was a valuable and beloved member of the team. Maybe Sevika could have been like a surrogate older sister replacing Vi. There's so much potential here, and it could have been far more believable and tragic relationship between Powder and Silco had she been a more fitting and dynamic part of the team. Maybe Powder could have been looking for Vi on the side after never finding her body, and Silco could have been supportive of her efforts in finding her missing sister. With that, there could have been this really fun tension with whether or not he'd get caught in the lie. The mission on the bridge could have been the pivotal moment in Powder and Vi's story. There could have been this explosive buildup of pent-up trauma between the two sisters. Maybe they start to make amends, and in anger of losing his protege, Soko could have set the bombs off to try to stop them. Maybe it could have been Sivika, angry at Powder's sudden betrayal to the cause. The point is, Vi should be able to actually have a moment with her sister, because as of right now, she isn't given a single chance to reach out to her without being interrupted by false choices or violence. Explosion at the bridge could have occurred, injuring Powder, and her transformation after the attack could have been what have turned her into Jinx that we come to know from the game. That way, we could have had a moment between Vi and Powder before she was too far gone. Also, why is Jinx okay with working with Silco after finding out that he had her family killed? Why is this level of Stockholm Syndrome being praised as good fathery material? Why does he put complete faith in only her? He trusts her because they've both been betrayed. Really? He was, in part, involved in the actions that led Powder to think Vi had left her. It's this weird paradoxical loop that doesn't make any sense. Number 8. Silco was a horrible father figure. This is gonna go well. 
The guy who is about to commando knife a child, that's the internet's good father figure. There's a boatload of fan art of him being a good dad. I won't show any of this artwork because I'm not here to knock on the artist. Plus, a lot of it is amazing work, but I find this to be an unhealthy relationship to be so fond over. He took her in instead of murdering her, which is nice, I guess, but bonding over a betrayal of a loved one is pretty silly, to put it nicely. They connected over being betrayed, but then he goes behind her back to try to have her sister killed. And I get it, he doesn't want her to be changed. She sees her as perfect the way she is, but it goes to show the kind of life Soko lives, where manipulations and betrayal are very common, and yet their connection is formed on the basis of a betrayal. Again, a betrayal in which he was directly involved in perpetrating. Does anyone else not see how baffling this is? I'm all for irony, and would be all for this dynamic if they actually spent more time to dive into why their relationship is how it is. But maybe having any kind of answers for motivations is too much for this show. Soko was never looking out for her best interest. Jinx was his project. Sure, she treats him like a father, but that shouldn't be held in a positive light to the viewer. It isn't a mystery. Soko later tells Jinx that he killed Vander, so she knows he was the one directly involved in shaping her life for where it is now. And she's oddly okay with supporting the man responsible for the death of her surrogate father, her friends, and for all she knows, her sister too, considering Soko convinced her that Vi was also dead. Powder would be smart enough to understand that implication. The man had just murdered almost everyone in her life that she knew. Did she think Vi just went upstate to the local farm? If she's dead, this man you're now looking to for support would have been the one who have killed her. So I ask again, what is their relationship? Because you have some explaining to do, right? Later on, Soko clears out a whole bar to go look for Vi, and Jinx immediately catches on to this because any rational person could tell she was out of the loop and something was going on. I want to say there's some fondness between them, but it's not really seen from Soko. He's just so wrapped up in his unbeknownst plans to achieve the nation of Zon. Jinx acts like a child and is very affectionate towards him, even though she never showed any physical affection towards Vander. Maybe this is meant to signify her slipping into madness, but it just comes off as uncomfortable and weird to me. Soko doesn't even reciprocate any affection until the story thinks it's warranted for an emotional punch. Powder losing herself to Jinx could have been powerful had we had known she and Soko shared any kind of bond, but instead it's almost comical the way he freaks out about almost losing his so-called child on a terrorist mission he sent her on. Maybe we're supposed to give him props for believing in her, because that's all what people want. It's someone supporting and believing in them. Soko didn't want to hold Jinx back on, you know, committing terrorism. Number nine. Jinx. Jinx is a character of tragic circumstance, but she's still a terrorist. Jinx could have been an interesting character, but she doesn't land for me, and it's bizarre the kind of treatment she gets online. Her personality is inconsistent, and the way it's used as a story device is incredibly painful. When needed, she's perceptive and smart, and she's able to work out critical information, engineer gadgets from scrap. And then there's the other side, where she's reduced to a child with no understanding of personal boundaries and who drops painfully cringe Wattpad lines instead of those of a professional production company. Maybe I'm just an out-of-touch boomer, but I have zero interest in Jinx. I feel bad for her, but I believe she needs help, and her current actions of being a terrorist make me cringe as she's treated as a lovable and enduring character. Whenever she's around Vi, all rationality goes out the window, because if Vi is able to talk to Powder for more than a few minutes, they might actually make amends. And that can't happen because then the story of the current lore of League can't happen, I guess. We have to leave things open-ended for the game, because if there's a definitive canon or an alternate universe, I guess fans would riot. Pun fully intended. We can't have the poster child acknowledging her wrongdoings because the implication that your mascot is kind of a horrible person wouldn't be the best of PR moves, but I'm not the one who made the show about a mentally tortured Harley Quinn-esque terrorist, so I guess you dug your own grave there, Riot. Jinx knocks out Vi after her second fight with Sivika, which at this point I guess is Vi's second preferred method of travel behind parkour. Vi being rendered unconscious once every three episodes, she might as well compete with Jinx with the amount of brain damage suffered. The back of her skull must be like that of a baby's from all the concussive blows she's taken. 
we then get to the final showdown, which just nicely summarizes every issue I've brought forth so far into one scene. It's really the magnum opus of what's wrong with this show for me. Vi immediately reaches Powder when she offers to run away. Jinx seems to be very moved by this, and at the slightest glimpse of reconciliation, Silco, being the absolute scumbag he is, sows doubt in Jinx about her sister, telling her that Vi would just abandon her again after, you know, he's the one to harp about Vi being disloyal after having tried numerous times to have her killed behind Jinx's back. They then go down the theatrical route that if Vi kills the show's biggest ship, Jinx will accept the terms and conditions and will run away with her. Vi rightfully shoots this down and then abandons the idea of trying to press on about both of them leaving and starting over to heal, even though this talk was clearly reaching powder. Soko goes off about how he never forsake Jinx, even though he had just gone behind her back trying to have her sister killed. Events transpire and Soko is mortally wounded, and as he dies, he of course doubles down on his beliefs that Jinx is perfect the way she is, and Powder is lost forever. I thought you could love me like you used to, she says, as if Vi hadn't spent the entire show trying to reach her and make amends and start over. But you've changed too, so here's to the new us. This line, I'm guessing, is in regard to the fact that Vi is no longer willing to kill someone to be her sister. I don't know if that's exactly a change in Vi, but it's an overall very positive way to live life, so I support Vi for growing as a person and not killing people in the name of her sister. If you can't tell, this went from frustrating to completely infuriating to me. Vi hadn't changed at all, and to risk sounding like a broken record, stories are frustrating when the conflict could be resolved if the characters just sat down and talked about their feelings. What? Is your way of showing affection through murder? Does Vi love you less because she won't kill the woman you have arbitrary beef with because Caitlin had the misfortune, pun intended, of being roped in these shenanigans? So Jinx goes off and, surprise, surprise, commits some more terrorism in a scene that's probably supposed to be the emotional peak between these two sisters, but instead leaves me sitting here just flabbergasted, wondering what on earth had happened to this show. Number 10, The Decline of Subtlety. All shows have their flaws, but it's these kinds of inconsistencies that eat away in me. I know Riot can make distinct and compelling characters. We see it in this series throughout, but once they are established, nothing ever really builds upon their initial impression. What started out as a compelling story between two sisters is stretched out into an ensemble of plot points that doesn't have enough time to breathe. Like, you can have more episodes, Riot. You don't have to spread the story out so thin. There's also a strange amount of hand-holding, especially in Act 2 and 3. I wouldn't mind each scene on their own, but collectively it starts to irritate me because it begins to show just how little this series trusts the audience to understand what's going on. And that's something I can't stand when shows dumb down their own story to the point where it feels incredibly insulting to the viewer. So the first scene I took issue with doing this was while Caitlin was analyzing the aftermath of the cargo ship CSI style, we get these unnecessary flashbacks of Jinx unloading her minigun on that supposed stealth mission they were on. Like, we know what had just happened here, we don't need a repeat. You can simply show Caitlin's face and let us know what she's thinking. Or you can show Caitlin's scene first and as she's uncovering the mystery, let the blown smuggling scene unfold so we don't have to see it twice. Like, your show constantly runs at a breakneck speed. You could have used this time to actually answer some questions rather than wasted on flashbacks we saw earlier this episode. I promise we're capable of retaining that information. Then, Kate saying Vi has a good heart and the audio echoing Vander saying it like we're 12 and can't understand why that line would be meaningful to Vi. You've got a good heart. Don't ever lose it. Despite it all, I can tell. You have a good heart. You've got a good heart. Cut to Soko at Marcus's house playing cards with Marcus's daughter. Anyone with a functioning brain, including Marcus, understands that this is a threat. But because we're babies, and very fittingly for Soko's own character death, all subtlety is thrown out the window as he topples the stack of cards, giving a little playful oops, and then stating to Marcus that accidents happen in a menacing tone. Like, we get it, Soko. You're threatening to kill a child. That's not out of character. What is, though, is the fact they're even trying to be subtle about it. There's Kaylin's shower scene. We know she's thinking about Vi. It isn't a mystery. Their breakup happened four scenes ago. We don't need an instant reverse slow-mo replay in her head. There's even flashbacks to moments characters didn't even witness. Jinx does this with the death of Milo and Clagger throughout the series. I know show, don't tell, but just because you're showing me a flashback doesn't mean you aren't using it as a crutch to tell me 
how a character is feeling instead of just letting that character show me through the screen. A good example of when this is properly used is when Vander gives Powder a drink to cheer her up, sees the stuffed animal, and pieces together that Vaya was sacrificing herself, or when Vander grips his bracer and he talks about the dangers besides Topside, and later the scene cuts to Silco and lets us piece together that this was exactly who he was referring to between these two characters. Jinx hums the song on the bridge that she sang in the intro of the pilot. I'm surprised with this one that they didn't have a flashback to that scene to make sure we really understood that they were pointing back to it. They even had enough restraint not to directly recreate the shot and allow us to use our big brains and connect the dots. When Victor steps on the purple flower and we hear a hiss, it hints to the fact that this plant helped bring forth the shimmer. These are great callbacks and it really rewards the viewer for paying attention. But then there's moments like this. We're in uncharted waters here and I can feel my body eroding. Did you get it? He's dying like the plant. Can't you tell we cut to a shot with both of them in the frame just to really drive home that Victor is dying? You know, like the plant. This is supposed to be a moving and serious moment, but instead it just has me whinging in pain, wondering if what happened to the show that was promised to me in the pilot's intro. All of this is less of a dig at Arcane, but more at this medium in general. It frustrates me when movies and television have this little faith in their audience. I know the show is capable of having thoughtful and moving moments. We see it time and time throughout. So it seems like this that hamper the quality and take away its emotional punch later down the line. Maybe it's just me, but I find scenes to be much more impactful when every detail isn't spelled out to you. And the show actually lets you interpret meaning on your own. Number 11. Tangents. So in comparison with the more pressing issues I've had with the series so far, these are more minor gripes. Don't get me wrong, they still bugged me, but they won't be as in-depth as the former part of the analysis has been. Number 11, subsection A, Earth to Echo. This is almost solely about Heimerdinger, but the headline was too good to pass up. Heimerdinger was a great scientist, but a horrible leader. His constant vague gatekeeping really got under my skin. He was the annoying parent of the show that would just say no to everything without going into depth as to why or providing an alternative to the situation at hand. The closest thing we had to an answer about why magic was so bad was a hand-drawn flashback that essentially stated magic bad so no magic allowed. Having these morals and fitting everything life throws at you into boxes of good and bad, and refusing to see the bigger picture just because it does not adhere to his moral system was very frustrating. Hardly see magic is out of the question to him, and he simply shoots it down without any thought to entertain the idea as too dangerous. Yes, this is an interesting character flaw, but the show doesn't ever explore it or ever has him question that aspect of himself. It's also impressive how he could go so long without understanding what the Undercity is like. At least he does atone for that and goes on a journey of self-discovery with Echo, where he's impressed that a man was able to build a community of refugees within a single lifetime. Like, wow, Heimer, I had no idea the bar was so low that humans creating a thriving community was seen as such an incredible accomplishment to you. Number 11B, Victor Torture Porn. The sex scene was a thing. Definitely the strangest sex scene since Queen and Slim, which fittingly also featured cross-cutting between two people banging to an acquaintance facing violence and death. Both are totally jolting and unintentionally hilarious. Like, you can make it as artsy and tasteful as you want, Riot, but playing out this... ...has the opposite effect of romance in my book. It's also funny to me the way they constantly torture Victor throughout the show. There's really no other analysis here. It just kept cutting back to him to hit him with another tragedy. I understand tragic moments can define people, but it's just absurd by the time he involuntarily vaporizes the assistant who'd been trying to reach out to him. I'm surprised they didn't go all in and have like the papers she wanted to show him be like a cure for child cancer or something. She just really hit home that Victor was having a bad day. Liquids. There's a ton of the human variety, like a ton. I'm sure it's very realistic to lose a mouthful of spit in a fist fight, but it doesn't make it any less gross when streams of liquid are gushing out of powder while she's crying. And lastly, there's Imagine Dragons. It all comes back to the intro. It's quite a bop, I'll admit. The music video itself has a ton of depth and personality on its own. I watched that thing several times before Act 2 was released. The only gripe I had was the character designs for the band members themselves. It was way too extra with the excessive amount of neon on their instruments. But I thought to myself, they're only in the music video. It's not like we had to see them in the show itself. Uh, I'm all for showing love to the people who help create your vision, but maybe have them blend into the world a bit more so it isn't as obnoxious. But yeah, anyway, that's all I got. Arcane was a pretty good show.